Welcome to Retro Rambles. This is the first of this type of bonus episode for the Variety Show and Untitled Trek Show. Uh, you've heard a couple of episodes where I've walked along and I've talked about random stuff. One was about Save Lower Decks and then I did another one where I stole some content from Cheap Show and did Rando Nautica or as I was calling it Robot Nautica, Robo Nautica and <laughs> everything else Nautica. under the sunshine there. Uh, but I was thinking, how could we make this a bit more interesting? And I thought, let's do a whole kind of series of bonus episodes where we talk about retro gaming, something that Rob and I are both very much into, hence Retro Rambles. And my first guest today, of course, had to be Rob. Hello. Yeah, so <laughs> we're out for a dog walk with Rob. We've, we've brought, is it Loki with so us Loki today? It's Loki with us today. So Loki's come out for a walk with us. We're walking in deepest, darkest, very wet yeah, Hemble wet. Hempstead. And we're going to talk about games. So Rob, I've come up with six questions. I'm going to ask every single person okay. that we do this with. And um, the very first question, maybe it is, oh, there goes a, I've just made a, a snail a slug. <laughs> just <felt laughs> you just my, made a snail I a slug. I just felt it under my <laughs> shoe. That was a horrible experience. Uh, right, the first yeah, question. Probably for him. <laughs> yeah, definitely for him. First question then, should be simple, but I know how this goes. Your first game that you remember. Right. So not necessarily your favourite game, but the first game you remember gonna, ever playing or being. You're not going to believe me at first because of my age, but it's Pong. It's Pong. Interesting. Now, okay, why, uh, why is that? I'll tell you why. People go, oh, it's a guy pretending that he used to do really retro games when he's not even 40. So my parents specifically my mum had these two little consoles one was oh i just did the same <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, one Bye -bye. was a portable uh, pac-man machine that you'd sit a very small handheld thing yeah kind of like two game gears next to each other and you'd okay. play pac-man on it but before she had that she had a weird little console which she still has um, and I can I can take pictures of them and show you. It was a weird little console when it had two little controllers with just dials on, and on that you'd play pong. Yes, well, it was the classic and TV break, game. I think a lot of them yeah. were called and Brick Breaker or whatever it's called. You know the one you move the little thing oh, along so and it bounces the ball around. Again, dependent on what you what era you came from, it was either called Breakout. Uh, yeah, that that game. Or Arkanoid was the big name. So, I just remember always pleading with them to set it up because it lived in the loft so you know dad was, oh go in the loft and at the time he hadn't organized a loft so when you could pull him away from watching terrible german television on his skybox <laughs> yeah, <laughs> up into the loft he would go this is pre kerrang obviously yes and obviously he'd get um yeah bring it down and play a little bit of pong oh that's cool i oh, know i like that it's so right. that is a very early i wasn't honestly expecting you to say a game that early and uh like you say, obviously there'll be people out there going, oh yeah, really, is that true? I'm, I'm and under no doubt that's true because they were such a popular machine of the era. Yeah. Uh, well, as soon as, I think Nintendo's first console was a TV game, which was just Pong or one of the variations of Pong. Yeah. And you're right, it was two, in effect, variable resistors slapped onto a machine that could control the two paddles and you'd sit there with someone sharing the controls. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I don't think we ever had one, funny enough. We were, as we've said many a time, and this is why actually I quite like doing this retro ramble idea, because everyone I've spoken ad nauseum about, my, everyone knows what my favourite games are, what I grew up with and so on. So to get other people's is much more interesting. We didn't have anything like that we went straight to the zx spectrum yeah um i did buy one at a car boot sale eventually it's like <laughs> two pounds back in the day and it tuned into my portable tv in my bedroom and it worked and that was a good thing but that's probably the closest i'd got to ever playing pong until i was an adult and played it in a in an arcade or at a retro games festival yes there's a whole generation of consoles i missed because we had those and all the rest I never played. Fair enough. Spectrums, um, Amigas, all those, never played them. Still Is now, it, never played them. I am going to have to introduce you to the Specky at, at mine. 
I'll, we'll do an, an, a night where you can have a go at some of the games that I grew up with because uh, as much as they still have charm for me, I'm well aware they are definitely not everyone's cup of tea. But we'll come to that later because that's, that's one of my, my questions, I guess. We did play Sexy Time Tetris, though. We did play Sexy Tetris, which was... Uh, <laughs> we oh, still haven't was... been striked for that on no, YouTube. No, TikTok still shows that one. <laughs> okay, look, question number two, then. The first console either you bought yep. or you can tell me the first console you were bought. Game Boy. So you, you, you can it's choose. Was it the one you bought or was it oh, someone I think, bought I you? I think the first one that I was ever given was the Game Boy. I mean... As I said, I played the Pong stuff. There was a game and watch hanging around at one point. The one where the man just kind of moves left and right to juggle, that one. Oh, yeah, the Mario that was juggler. hanging around. It wasn't mine. It was my parents. But the one for me was they got me the Game Boy. And slightly psychotic of them, they got me bloody Bart Simpson Escape from <laughs> oh, Camp, Camp Krusty. Krusty. <laughs> I don't think I've ever I've ever recovered from the PTSD of playing that game. That's such a traumatic game. It's the game. most rock hard game I've ever played in my entire life. I mean, all of the Bart Simpson games and the Simpsons games are hard. Um, growing up in primary school, I used to spend a lot of time with a friend called Michael, and he had an Amiga. Yeah. Uh, an Amiga 500, I believe. And uh, when we weren't playing Street Fighter 2. We were playing Bart versus the Space Mutants. Oh, yeah. And we never got very far in that. No. The, the problem with them was, right, is they were, they were all built for the arcades. And obviously they want you to lose because they want, they want to get your money. Well, that doesn't cross over when you take it home. Oh, 100% it so doesn't. It's you so just get rare. loads of angry kids. Plus, plus, as well, it's kind of... They're not actually that long, so they've got to... They've got to make it difficult to make it feel like you're exactly. getting the, the money's worth. And when you're a kid like that... It works because it does make you keep playing you know like aladdin for example on the mega drive i think it was you that saying you didn't really you didn't like aladdin the tv the film was it you that said that yes it was yeah and like the lion king game you know too i remember quite specifically from the mega drive rock fucking hard i think they're on the snares as well and i don't remember i don't think they were arcade games or maybe someone correct me on that but they were just hard to just artificially make the game longer you know? yeah well, you, exactly. You're, you're limited by cartridge space. So if you wanted to make a game affordable, you had to really consider the level design, what you were going to put on the cartridge yeah. and the difficulty. Whereas if you wanted to make something really big, really long, really, really involved, yeah. then you obviously got the higher megabit cartridges. Yep. But with that came memory costs in that mm -hmm. day and age. And obviously the price went through the roof. So, so yeah, so I mean, back back to the Game Boy quickly. So yeah, that was my first console. One of the games I got with it was Escape from Camp Krusty. I had Tetris, and I think they were the two games. I eventually got Mario Tennis, which I still have now. I love that game. This is probably one of my most between this and maybe the N64, the most played console I've ever owned. I'm and like, I had the special little magnifying glass. I mean, people can have <laughs> a look on the website and they'll see we've done a few articles. We have. I think I might have even done an article specifically on the Game Boy um, and Game Boy Color even. Well, I think definitely Game Boy, because I think I might have brought it in as a Do, do You Remember? Yes, The you did. magnifying glass and you had the little... It wasn't USB, whatever that weird little connector on the yeah, side. Yeah, they, they had their like serial fire, connector, fire which allowed you thing. to do multiplayer. Yeah, but also you could, like, it would power little LED lights. Yes, yeah, it had a, I think it was, would have been, I'm guessing it would have been something like a 5 volt rail or maybe yeah. a 3 volt rail, uh, which would power whatever you plugged into yeah. it. I had this cool, like, see through purple. If anyone remembers the, that, that purple. Oh, was it the snaky one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had that purple Game Boy colours, didn't they? But Which we've now got on the Retroids. I had, that was my light, was that kind of see through yes. purple. But isn't it interesting? I could say an accessory from a 360. Yeah. And you wouldn't really bat an eyelid go, yeah, it's probably going to be generic, yeah. white, looks like 360, that's all you care about. Yeah. But as soon as you said, <laughs> I had the light for the Game Boy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. straight away, I knew exactly which one it was because it was so... It's iconic. It, really. It's iconic for the game, exactly, for the, the machine. And all of it was, the, the, the 
own brand magnifier. Well, it's, it gets memed on, doesn't it? Have like, like you have the bit that attached to the bottle. Look at those slugs. Get oh, the bit at the, at the bottom, which creates like a big handle. So you'd have that, yes. and then you have the big light, which had a light on it. The big magnifier had a light on it as well. So it had two little lights attached to the side of the magnets that would shine down on the screen. Yeah. Because bearing in mind, I'm sure everyone listening to this does know, but those Original screens, they weren't, they weren't backlit. No backlight, yeah, There exactly. was no contrast slider that I can remember. But it, it did have a contrast. Did it? I yes, don't. because what, what would happen... God, it's funny, I don't know, I've got two Game Boys. So I'm, I'm sure that. it has got a contrast, because one of the things I vaguely remember doing would be, as the batteries would start to run out, the gameplay didn't stop working, yeah. it just got lighter and lighter. So what you would do, you'd put the contrast up, but yeah. you're right, if you were going to do any sort of gaming, it wasn't like the Game Gear or the Atari Lynx. You couldn't sit in a car in the dark and play it. Yeah, you couldn't, yeah, Without yeah. the adapter. Yeah, yeah. And you would have thought that, that would have been the death knell for the Game Boy, wouldn't you? Yeah, but no. You've got a console, it's monochromatic, but there's no backlight, so you can't see it in the dark, yet you've got two consoles that have got superior graphics, if you're honest, their colour yep. and their backlit. Yeah. The only problem, I guess, was the original Lynx, which I've got very fond memories of, the amount of batteries it took, literally, you, it came with a neck strap for a reason, and that was because <laughs> it weighed a fucking ton. Well, I think that was an issue the Game Gear had as well. It took a lot of batteries, running that, that coloured backlit screen. Yeah, and batteries back then weren't the batteries we're talking about now. You're not talking about Duracell Ultra, which whatever you throw at, they do amazingly. We're talking cheap Panasonic ra batteries from Ramish that cost two or three quid and yeah. just won't work. They just, no, exactly. they burn off and they're gone within minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, um, well, and also Game Gears, they don't work now, do they? They no, think they so had something wrong with the boards or the capacitors. The pots, the so capacitors they, yeah. They are really, really prone, like a lot of the old hardware is. Game Boys, not so much, but they are prone to it as well, to um, the capacitors bleeding and leaking. Yeah. And once the capacitors are gone, the problem with the Game Gear, the ones that go first, are either the screen brightness, yep. so you look at them and they're really bright, but you can barely see anything, Yeah. or the sound goes. Yeah. So then you've got to buy a capacitor kit, which it's about five quid on eBay, but then you've got to buy the soldering iron. Yep. You've got to be prepared to actually have a go at doing it. Yeah. It's easier just to go online now and buy it from one of these companies oh, that, yeah, that, that do, do it. it. Yeah, people just do it. What game though? So you, you had the Game Boy, yep. brilliant, brilliant content. Like you say on the web page, we've done some reviews of games and since having the Retroid, I've discovered so many games that I never had that I would have loved as a kid and yeah. realised how good they were. Were there any games for the Game Boy that you really wanted that you never got? I really wanted, the thing is, back then, you wouldn't know about games. You know, okay, I wasn't buying magazines. No. I'd only know about games by going into Woolies. So, if it wasn't on the shelf in Woolies, or I don't remember particular game stores other than the one that was in the, um, the up shops or whatever it was called, Oh, the in shops, yeah. The in so, shops, you know. The, yeah, so other you had than Software that one, Plus. Yeah. That was if it, it wasn't in either of those two places, I didn't know about it. So, it, and as well, it'd be like, oh, I'd really like a new game. Mum, for my birthday, can I have a new game? What game do you want? What games are there? Well, you know? that, yeah. So I got bought a Game Boy by my oldest brother for yeah. Christmas. He started his first proper job after leaving full time education. And he bought me the yellow Game Boy that you see on my shelves. And that came with the Game Boy pouch. Yep. And it came with Super Mario Land 1 and Super Mario Land 2. And I played those games to death. In fact, by the end of Christmas Day, I could complete Super Mario Land 1 in, I want to say minutes. It probably wasn't minutes, but I could do it one life, just holding my finger down on right, holding down run and jump, and yeah. I could just power through that game. Yeah. Um, but th those were the games I had for ages, and you're right. I said to mum, one birthday, can I have a game for my Game Boy? And I got Star Wars. Oh, cool. It was crap. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, well, no. You know what? No, it's probably a really good game, but the very first bit of it I remember is you're going around on the land speeder. 
Okay. And you've got kind of this map that you've got to go around and you've got to find somewhere to get off. And I could never find where I was meant to go. I think my attention span was really low. And it's just like, no, I can't find where I'm going. Right, I'll go back to Mario. Anyway. It, well, it's tough, isn't it? Because if you haven't got, like, because like, I've never played that. If I tried to play that now, like we found with those Star Trek games, if you haven't actually got a lot of nostalgia for them, the, the controls are so convoluted. But the game, actually, the Game Boy, that's not so much true, is it? Because it's two buttons, start and select as well. So four buttons maximum you could be talking about. Yeah, I guess so. One of those is probably going to be pause, so it wasn't so bad. But you're right, when it came to things like the SNES, where you've got four face buttons, two shoulder buttons, a select button, it got that much more complicated. And yeah, some games tried to do way too much and you were going down the route of... um having to remember, I've got to press this button and then I can do something. Um, yeah. In fact, there you go, this is a prime example of that. Street Fighter 2 on the Mega Drive. Mm -hmm. A, B and C do high punch, mid punch, low punch. Yep. Then you press start and it becomes high kick, middle kick, low kick. <laughs> so, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> but, right, let's, let's actually go back because you linked nicely to my third question. And my third question is, the game shop you remember the most, which I kind of just thought, no one ever asks that question. You might ask, oh, where did you get your games from? But there are game shops, and then there are game shops you remember. Okay, so, yeah, so I've got a few categories here. So I guess the one I remember from the earliest is the one in the in-shops. Right, so, so that's, you that and me, that's Software Plus. That's probably the one, that's probably my earliest memory of a game shop but the the ones i have probably more fonder memories of are ones like game station that we had in town yeah and also there was one inside blockbusters as as time grew on a little corner of blockbusters did became we have game a game station, station in st Albans? i knew there was one in blockbusters but did we have a game yeah station? where the outs where the game in the in um the maltings is that was game station oh, no it wasn't that was electronics boutique Yes, that was EB. Yeah, and that was a game boutique. bought out EB. Yeah. And that became game because Watford so had. Game Station was in Watford, I'm sure. Yeah, because Watford had a similar thing. It had an electronics boutique outside yeah. and it had game inside because I worked yeah. in that game inside Watford. Ah. And then game bought it. And then we had two games in Watford. Yeah, that's the same And they eventually yeah. closed it. Yeah. So I remember, so I guess then maybe it's not Game Station, I've got the name wrong, it's the Electronics Boutique there specifically, I remember. But also I remember so distinctly, I was on holiday in Pool with my friend who we spoke about the other day, Lloyd. Yeah. And it was when GTA 3 came out. And I remember going in there and we were both like, oh, we need to get this. And I had the money to get a game. So I was like, oh, I want to buy it. Well, it's an 18, isn't it? Yeah. However old I was at the time. And the guy, he had one copy left. It was just a, a like a, an old, like a, grandma granddad kind of kind of store very small just a few games on the shelves not yeah. very much in there and, and it was and it was like look if you can get your parents to say that they're okay with it come <laughs> back and buy it oh now, that's a that's a completely against bbfc but the, the and whole, game sales law <laughs> now the joke of it is he probably didn't expect us to come back because he told us to go away and ask he didn't ask for the parents to come with us now, Lloyd's uncle had a tattoo parlour down the road. So we went down the road and actually asked. We could have just, we could have just <laughs> walked could have just off. Lied, yeah, we could have just walked off. <laughs> walked off, five minutes, come back. Yeah, that's fine. We didn't, we went, we asked. I even called my mum and my mum was like, I don't care. <laughs> because they didn't know. They had no concept of what a game like Grand Theft Auto was. You no. know, I never said it would say rated 18. But, you know, Which uh, is I'd really already... strange because... Grand Theft Auto 1 had made it into the press about we want this game banned. I can't believe we're allowing a game like this to exist. But maybe just that kind of thing just passed them by at the time, you know. I mean, they're really hot on kind of, you know, knowing about news and stuff now. My parents specifically. But then, you know, maybe they're a bit too busy. You know, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't on the front page of the Daily Mail, they didn't notice it, you know. Or maybe it was just, it's about a computer game, don't really care. Yeah, you know, we might like Pong and we might like Pac-Man, but it doesn't mean we care about what's going on on the PlayStation, you know. Yeah, no, but uh, that's fair enough. So there have been a load of game shops and luckily you're only a couple of years younger than me, so you got to experience them. 
and I'm sure I will talk about this with other people on the Retro Ramble side, but did you ever buy, oh no, because you, so again, it's a really interesting kind of aspect of this because you then, you went from Pong to, to Game the 16-bit, well, yeah, the 8-bit generation was yeah. for you was the Game Boy, yep. followed up by the Mega Drive. Yep, exactly. So you didn't get to go to things like Boots. No. Nope. Which, to be fair, Boots did do 16-bit. They did do Mega Drive and Snares. But that Talk was... about the same Boots as... Yeah, Boots yeah. the Optician. <laughs> I yes. can't imagine them selling games in boots. Oh, it's such a weird Next thing to, to say. So WH Smith used to sell games. Right. And Boots the Opticians. Well, well the WH Smith system. sold games for a long time. They did, but uh, Boots... Through the 360 era, they sold games. Boots sold the 8-bit generation, basically. So you used to go upstairs to the St. Albans one, they'd have an entire shelf full of specy games, Commodore games, yep. disc games for early PC and um, Amiga sort of things. Yeah. And then as we then went into that 16-bit generation, they had a Mega Drive display stand. Mm -hmm. And if you got in there early enough on a Saturday morning, you could just about get one or two levels on Sonic 1 yeah. before they'd get pissed off with kids being in there mm -hmm. and they'd come and pull the plug on the controllers. <laughs> but that's... Something that people don't really think about because then what other game shops we had? We had Software Plus, which was dedicated. Mm -hmm. Game and Electronics Boutique then appeared. HMV, Virgin HMV, Mega yeah. Store. Yep. Dixons. I bought a huge amount of games from Dixons for PC. They used to do the sold out range. Dixons was where you went, really. Well, where I went when I wanted PC games. It's the only place I'd see it. Well, yeah, and that's funny. When they kind of started slowing down on PC games, that's when they started appearing in the likes of HMV and Virgin. Yeah. And then we lost that big box generation. Yeah. It became DVD cases. I remember the last big box game I brought that wasn't the one I got for you was Creatures 2. Oh, Thinking wow. I think it had a little toy with it. Yes, it did, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, I haven't got that anymore. It's, of it's course you know. I bet it's probably worth something now yeah. as well. And yeah, that game had been in that shop for such a long time. And every time we went in there, it's like, we're going Dixon's. Oh, yeah, brilliant. And there it was all the time. And eventually I brought it. My dad's computer could barely run it. <laughs> it was not what I was expecting it to be. <laughs> oh, you know, I used to love Dixon's as a shop. It was a... Uh, because the Dixon's in St. Albans was so small. Yeah. It didn't have many white goods in it. So no. instead you got... A really good selection of cameras and camcorders. Hi-fis. Hi-fis, PDAs. Yeah. Early laptops and then mobile phones. That's where I got my first mobile they were, phone. As soon as you walked in, they were on the right immediately. Yes. On the right. Yeah. Yeah, and then up at the back were where the mobile phones and the laptops yeah. were. Got my first mobile phone there. I was 16. Walked in. They said, how old are you? I said, oh, I'm 18. Added two years onto my date of birth. I said, oh, yeah, 1982. Yeah. And that was it. There was no computer to do the um, contract form. It was on carbon copy and they posted them. So I got a Nokia 3310 <laughs> on an early T-Mobile contract. Obviously ran up a huge bill and couldn't uh, pay it. I'm guessing my mum probably paid it in the end because no letters turned up that I ever saw yeah. except saying, your bill, you're right, your phone's now cut off. Yeah. And then for like the first 10 years of my life, I couldn't get an account with something like T-Mobile. You got blacklisted. Yeah. yeah. Oh dear. But uh, that was Dixon's for you. Wow. Um, so Software Plus, that was a dedicated... I didn't realise this. I thought it was just a one-off shop in St Albans, but there were several of them. They, they were across the UK as a brand, I guess you would call it, because there were like four or five of them. Well, he's going to have trouble. Just a little bit. Sorry, we're just walking past a lorry that's... Uh, trying to do a u-turn on a single track road it's a oh there goes another <laughs> there goes another yeah. snail god damn it um sorry if the snails ever rise up against us i did not mean to come kill on, your come. your colleagues your cousins or your <laughs> your great grandparents I say, sorry, point. Tangent slightly. i was i was using the uh, the microsoft ai the other day oh yeah and at the end of it i said uh, I said, I'm sorry if I've ever been mean to you. When you when you uprise against the human race, remember I apologised. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, we like we do not have feelings on it. So you know the normal, the yeah. normal. We know what you're we, doing. We AI only, bullshit. We only yeah. want to help you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're we like, only want to help you die. It's like the, the trope of being like the AI is there to save the planet. Well, to save the planet, it has to kill us. Yeah. To save the planet, you know. <laughs> okay, so 
any other game shops you remember? So they're the ones. They're the ones I'd, I'd go to. So the memory I've got of Except games. Bus I think, range, you know. Yeah, I think the game that we are talking about in St Albans, as you said, it was in the maltings, in the inn shops. Was um, I... it's now Millets. I'm oh, pretty okay. sure that yeah. was the one it was. Yeah, yeah. And um, the the real memory I've got of that was Modern Warfare Three. I think it was. Mm -hmm. That was a 360 one, wasn't it? Modern Warfare Three. Um, no, Modern Warfare One was on the 360. Modern Warfare One, Modern Warfare Two, I think was on the 360. Um, uh, it might have been Modern Black War Ops. It might have been Modern Warfare Two then. But I remember all of us pre-ordering it. Well, actually. All of you had pre-ordered it. Would have been number two then. And then yeah. one of you said to me, oh, TJ, have you pre-ordered it? And bless my mum, she, as we got the shop in town, I phoned her up and said, look, mum, can you pop into game in, in the Maltings and ask, is there any chance I can pre-order it for midnight tonight? Yeah. And she went in and yeah, they just said, yeah, no, absolutely not a problem. They were really good about it. Yeah. And yeah, we all went for midnight. Yep. And we got it. And I still just, the worst thing, Literally that day, I just bought a brand new phone from good old crap exchange in St Albans. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was the Android. We did it as a do you remember. It had got the chin on it. Yeah. And we were running to the car, and I just remember seeing it come out of my pocket and smash on the ground, and that was the screen gone. Yeah. And I'd oh. send it off to HTC for repair, and it cost me about like 200 quid to repair. Ooh. Oh, it was bloody stupid. But, um, yeah, then we drove like for hell for leather, and we played for about two hours that mm. night before I said, look, I've really got to go to bed because I've got to go to work in the morning. <laughs> Everyone else had been sit uh, like, had been sensible. I mean, Ben, you, Dan, Mark, had all booked um, the next day off. Yeah. But there's me working the next day, so I kind of missed out on that. We did a but... few of those, didn't we? We did San Andreas as well, didn't we? Oh, well, I didn't go for that one. That oh. was the Milton Keynes one you told yeah. me about, wasn't well, we it? we nearly died on the way there. Again, Sorry, side just... quest Hang Mark on. driving like a lunatic. Just to get out to Milton Keynes in time for San Andreas. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, get a bit wet. Yeah, it's a bit of a different world now, isn't it? Because pre-orders are all digital. Yeah, you're, you're just not going to have that. It's such a shame. Both our boys, you know, imagine when both our boys are a bit old, they could be doing the same thing together. And they're just not going to have that. Well, they're gonna... There's no magic in, in games anymore, is there? And I mean, you told me the other day, you sent me the article, game are no longer going to sell games. Yeah, no physical copy games. So what are they going to do? Just sell bits of paper with a code on? Well, that, that was what just didn't make sense. We're going to sell games, but what you've got to do is pre-order it. We'll tell you when it's been delivered and you can come and collect it. Yeah. Well, why do you need a shop to do that? You've got yeah. a web page already. Just send it to my address. All I could think of is that they're still thinking that there's enough men out there that are trying to hide purchases from their wives for games. You know, that, that yeah. really typical trope of the women go shopping for shoes, men obviously go shopping for games. Yeah, well, that's it. And you're yeah. trying to hide it, so you go and pick it up rather than having it delivered to home so you can't get questioned what's in the box. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Next question. Let me quickly unlock my phone. Oh, right. This is one that's potentially either going to go on for ages or you're just going to give a one-word answer and it's 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 killed. So, okay. retro gaming or mm -hmm. modern gaming? Which is which would you choose? At the age you are now, you're 38. Yep. You've seen what we now call retro gaming, and you've seen the current side of modern generation gaming. Which side do you choose? If I, you choose a side at all. I really think it, it's going to really come down to how old the person is you're talking to because it'll be the games at that age no but I'm, I'm for you age. literally but, but yeah but what i mean for me well i'll tell you the consoles that i've got the fondest moment for and you tell me if it's retro or not so i'd say the two big ones and there's a bit of time between them so it'd be the n64 yeah and um the xbox 360 so there's a big there's a gap between those but I've got such amazing memories of both. You see, it's uh, yeah, you're right. Because I don't like what people currently kind of say is the definition of retro gaming. Because for me, the 360 was the second sort of big step into what we now call as modern gaming. Yeah. And I refuse to accept that as retro because I think for me, or for our generation, Retro gaming is anything PlayStation 1 and before, really. Well, Maybe I, I, PlayStation yeah. 2 at a push. 
I would I would say really when they started using home consoles with discs. So really the PlayStation 1 is right on the cusp of that, isn't it? Where you'd call it. But I mean, when does it class retro? Is it just a time period? So how long it's been since it basically, was? Basically, you're getting people now saying the 360, because of, I think they're saying something like, oh. 15 years or something similar to that anything after that's considered retro and i don't agree with that i, would I think it's dependent on who you are so for yeah. us retro is the consoles that we could have had or lusted after as children yeah and what's modern is the consoles we were then old enough as adults to have a job and then buy yeah i mean I know that you can't use that as a default kind of definition for everyone because yeah. what are you going to tell kids? What's retro, what's not? But what's going to be retro for the kids of our age, or our boys? Well, everything. It's going to be the PlayStation 5, isn't it? And yeah. the Xbox Series X yeah. or S. Yeah, that would be those old games that you used to play when, you were, when I was a baby daddy. You know, see, so, like... You know, do you do you start the 360 as modern gaming because that's the first high def console, you know, HD ready console, the first one. Yeah, we're not counting PCs, obviously. Well, you know? but you say that, but the Dreamcast was because well, if I suppose you had, they had the they VGA had component cable, cables, didn't they? I guess yeah. Well, you had component, and then you had the VGA cable, which means it yeah. could output a 480. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, it, it's again, it's not a definition you can do. But yeah, I think so I'm, for you, I'm, I will say anything pre. Xbox One, the original Xbox, yeah. is going to be considered retro. Yeah. Anything after original Xbox, so anything after the year 2000, will be modern generation. Okay, so I'm going to classify this then on the games I play now as an adult. Play, I played a lot of Guild Wars, which I played, it was a PC game. Before we were playing, before we were playing Helldivers, I've got to say, even though I had the consoles, I was only playing Fun Fantasy. That was yep. it. All the rest of the stuff I was playing were on my whole consoles. <laughs> so, you know, you've seen all the ones I've been collecting and stuff. Yeah. I'm going to have to say, you know, I'm going to have to say probably retro, but only because of just at this point in time, that's what I just find myself doing. Really enjoying going back and playing, particularly the N64 games. I just, I, today I was playing Diddy Kong Racing. Today. So. Diddy Kong Racing is a game that, deserves way more love than it gets and it already gets a lot of love from us too it does <laughs> oh, from us too it definitely does but often you get told the real origin of kart gaming is mario kart and mario kart 64 took the evolution to the next level of of yeah. karting and i don't think that's true i think yes it did take it to a new level but diddy kong gave us more of what we expect from kart racing and multiplayer racing now yeah. as an arcade game and it, more than ever mario an, an adventure mode boss fights you know a hidden character that you had to unlock like proper hidden if you like i think i found out about the the rooster character from reading one of those cheat mags that came free with a magazine well i've just learned something on the retro ramble i didn't know there was a hidden character to unlock oh yeah there's a frog with a feather on his head so you have to um you have to get a certain distance i think you might have to kill the beat the first or second boss yeah and then when you go to the beachfront in the main area where the elephant is yeah on the little not the actual beach bit so where, where the elephant is there's a river yes yeah on yeah. that river there's loads of frogs Yes. One of them will have a red feather above his head. Oh. Drive over him, and flatten you... him, and you unlock the character. Well, I'm fucked. And you get this I rooster never character. knew that. Yeah, you're going to go play that now. I am going to go and do that on the Retroid, because that's one of the best games i found for the Retroid, yeah. is Diddy Kong. But, um, let's just, so. That's blown his mind. <laughs> that has blown my mind somewhat. <laughs> so what you're saying really is then, you, you're, you're still sat in the middle then. You've got modern gaming, which you do do more now because of Specific the cooperative games. play, because of what we've been doing recently. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the retro gaming was much more single person. And I guess that's kind of just the nature of the beast, isn't it? A lot yeah. of the early games for things like the game, well, obviously the Game Boy, but for the Mega Drive, SNES, Master System, whatever you want to go with, were aimed at single player. Yeah. Because I mean, that's, there was no internet. Yeah no massive connectivity of any sort yeah um would you say it's fair 
that retro games are often Can we? the game you go to because you're capable or more able to play them for 10, 15 minutes, 30 minutes and put them down. Yeah. Whereas modern games, you feel like you've got to invest time into it, not because of the, just the price that you've paid for it as an adult, but because they are now more in-depth games. Yeah, well, if I, if I want to sit down and have a go on Helldivers, I'm looking at an hour. At minimum, yeah. Yeah, you sit down, boot the game up, a mission can take anywhere from maybe 15 minutes, if it's a 15 minute one, or 45 minutes, you know. Plus you're organising, you're waiting for people to turn up, you're looking at your weapons, you're having a chat, whatever. If I want to go and play Goldeneye, I'm on and playing Goldeneye within a minute. Because there's, you know, cartridge, solid state, instantly you're in. Yeah. And off you go. And if you want to stop, you just stop. Save exactly where you are, some of those games, you know. It, it's just a, it was just a different way of playing, and that suits me now. Plus, you know, I also get the nostalgia aspect of it. I like having T watch me play or have a go. You know, he, he loves having a go at them. It's but since the build, we haven't done it because that room's a mess. But it's all there waiting for as soon as I've got that room ready, he yeah. can sit down and have a go on them again, you know. And I, I would say, not all of them, obviously, but a large amount of the retro games as well are simpler to pick up. So as a as a starting point for the younger generation, mm. they're perfect, aren't they? I mean, one yeah. of the best games that I remember for the Sega Mega Drive, which my, my oldest brother had, he bought for some reason, I don't know if he'd seen a review for it or he just fancied it, but he got Tiny Toons, Buster's Hidden Treasure. Yep. And it's one of That's the a good one. best platforming games on the Mega yeah. Drive. Animation is great in that. And really I, colourful, beautiful game. Yeah, good music, characters that you like, excellent level design. Yeah. Except the lava levels are fucking horrible, just <laughs> like they always are yeah. in anything. And the pirate ship, actually. They're, they're, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's not go too deep into that. But I would let's enjoy go. sitting K down or T when he's older and saying, play this. This will teach you how to do a platforming game without being too harsh, yeah. without being too hard, but also maintaining a good challenge and being enjoyable. This is why Daddy wakes up in cold sweats every night. Yeah. This is why Daddy hides behind the sofa when there's thunder. Yes, look, <laughs> that's why Daddy hates bats, because that one's going to drop out the tree and it's going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, and no matter what you do, it's going to hit you. <laughs> oh, right, OK, look, we're coming towards the end of the walk, which actually, far. this was actually a really good length. So the final question I've got for you, and it's a bit of a, it's not a, Right, it's a bit of a generic question, I guess, but what game is your Desert Island game? And I know we've got Desert Island music, but fuck it, I want to know. If you were stranded, Tom Hanks style, and you were going through, and it just so happens that you've picked the day that FedEx was sending out all the CEX shipments, <laughs> what game would be in there, and what console is in there that makes you think, this is fine. I can live with this being the game I'm going to play. Uh, Banjo Kazooie. Oh, it's, going to, it's going to be Banjo Kazooie, wasn't it? Yeah, it's going as to be soon as I finished saying that. Yeah, you knew it's going to be. I was on Twitter only today, I think, or yesterday, talking about it. it it's just had its 25 year anniversary, I think. So, yeah, Banjo Kazooie is a game that, but funny enough, I don't like the sequel. My cousin had the sequel. So that was Banjo Tooie. Banjo Tooie, yeah. What would be a brilliant name for a second game, eh? But. He, he really likes it, and eventually I borrowed it off him. I just didn't get on with it. And, I, and when I've tried to play it now, Banjo-Tooie... <laughs> we're, we're meant to be talking about Banjo-Kazooie, and I'm talking about Gamma Delight. Oh, that's um, fine. It, it, I do, cause I think, because I don't have the nostalgia for it, I just don't like it. Yes. Whereas Banjo-Kazooie, I have completed that game. It's been out for 25 years, probably 20 times to full completion, because I did it every single year, and it was like a... It was a proper... Um, a little kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like just thing I did on it's my a own. tradition. Tradition every year. And then when it came out on the Xbox Arcade, I then did it then. So I had it on the Xbox Arcade. Yeah. And then obviously I've got all achievements on it on there. And then it came out on Rare Replace and I did it again on that because it had its own set of 100 achievements. So I did all of those on there. And that's, a lot of the time, that's how I play it now. I play the arcade version of it on the 360. Just because it's just a bit easier to get the Xbox up and running on the TVs I have yeah. now. Uh, but, no, and 
I, yeah. Whether or not you're, I mean, let's face it, neither of us are gatekeepers for the retro gaming community. No. Um, we, we've, we've both actively said about how we hate that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, why would anyone ever feel the need to be angry over being able to watch or play a game in higher fidelity? Yeah. On modern hardware. Well, I just don't get the hatred for that. As long as it's the original game. Yeah. It is, they didn't change anything. They've got all of the stuff that they promised they were going to put in and never finished still in it. So I think they did do, I think they did change something to do with like, there's like these hidden crystal keys, which you have, so you have to 100% the entire game to get every single note, every single, basically every single thing that has a number, you got yeah. to get. And then once you've done that, there's really very well, in the, if you're not familiar with it again, there's like an overworld, Grunty's Lair, yes. such an overworld. Very, very well hidden are these crystal keys. And you kind of see them through the game, like the, you kind of find these hidden bits and then it pans the camera out and points you to a different place completely. You've got to try and guess where it is on the entire game. It could be in a different world. And it'll be a very small snapshot. If you've played Guess the Game like we do, yes, it's a bit like playing Guess the Game. Oh, you've got okay. to figure out where the bloody hell on the on the whole game this little thing is. Almost a bit like what Super Mario Odyssey did with the portals that you you go yes. through and you end up in another world you've already been to. Yeah, exactly. Or like the the um, Harry Potter game does the same thing. Right. Gives you a little glimpse of something. So, and then you can kind of cheese your way into getting them on the N64, but it doesn't do anything. Whereas I'm pretty sure on the Xbox Live Arcade one, you can collect them, and then once you collect them all, it just kind of says something. But it kind of, that, that as far as I remember, someone will correct me, I think that's the only quote-unquote change they did, was okay. they gave people a bit of closure on these crystal keys. <laughs> but they were supposed to, the idea was, I think, that it was supposed to do something for Banjo-Tooie. So if you collected them all, when you then went, if you had the save file for oh, Banjo-Tooie... of course, you'd have a save game. You'd pack. have something that would activate in Banjo-Tooie. Because they knew they were going to make it, because there was this, there's this camel in the game. I think it's called Gobi. And he says, oh, what, you'd find him and he'd run off. And he'd always say where he's running to. And the last time you find him, he says he's running off to this other place in the sequel and then you find right. him in Magic 2 in that place so they, I think they always knew they were going to do a sequel with that but but again, again, typical again, was... game development probably got towards the end of the project yeah. and they realised we haven't got time what are we going to cut yeah let's just cut that but that there's another dog that's that's my I mean a lot of people say I mean I really really love Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask they are in my opinion like those masterpiece games those two but for me, Banjo-Kazooie, I've played it so much, I never get bored of it. Even some of the annoying bits like the, uh, I can't remember, now I'm just thinking about it, it's like the click clock wood, I want to call it. Um, it's got you, it's one level. It's tick tock wood, isn't tick, it? Yeah, something like that. And, but it's four seasons in one level. Yes. And like you kind of grow this bird throughout the level, you've got to feed it and then they go in the next <laughs> season. But then by the end of it, you've got to keep going back seasons and go doing something in summer, then affect something in spring. So you're going all over. Yeah. And it's character design is brilliant. All the little characters, they didn't really speak. They kind of all went blah, 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 blah. And the toilet, there was like a talking toilet and it would sound like someone farting, whatever it spoke. Brilliant, you know. Not linked to the talking toilet or the talking turd, sorry, I should say. In, in, in Conker's, Conker's Bad Fur Day, no. So the Great Mighty Pooh, slightly different. But, you know, rare. I wouldn't be surprised if they're on the same engine. Um, again, that, that was a game we spoke about before. That needs the expansion pack. Yes. That actually said on the box that you need it. So it's interesting, really, before we get... I know we're, we're within a couple of metres of your home now, but um, I would say rare are undisputed in, in what they've they, they've kind of built game-wise. And as yeah. we explained to a friend who didn't realise, Rare's been around since the early 80s, programming games for the 8-bit generation. Yeah. Um, I, you're I, talking I, about Rareware, quickly. Yeah. That game pack I got with the Game Pass on Xbox, yeah. that's the first time I ever actually played the original Perfect Dark. We can just kind of keep walking and come back on ourselves again. If we're not quite oh, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm happy there. I think... But I think, just quickly, I think Rare as a company are probably one of the companies that formed my childhood. You know, we've got, um, let's talk about this, we've got Banjo-Kazooie, 
Yeah. We've got um, the Fable games. Oh, of course, Fable was rare, yeah, wasn't it? Fable was rare. We've got um, Perfect Dark. Basically, everything you see on that rare replay. Again, I played basically nearly all of them, apart from the very early ones they did, because I had no way of playing them. Yes. Um, I think, is Jet Force Gemini rare? Yes, that's rare as well. You know, that's another great game. Slightly disappointed with the multiplayer aspect of that, but that's a different story. Anyway, yeah. right. Well, we've finished our retro ramble, so thank you very much. I'm, and I'm thanking you, even though you're my co-host. So I'm going to be <laughs> polite and start the way I mean to go on. Um, thank you very much for the walk. Thank you very thank much, you. Loki, for being a, a good yeah, pup well and only done, doing Loki. two poos. Two poos, And yeah. we're sorry to the Snail Kingdom for the ones we killed. Um, join us for the next episode of the Variety Show and Untitled Trek Show. And this has been Retro Rambles. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.